Okay, the economic survey is out telling us the state of the economy, telling us what is likely to happen in the coming year, and including all kinds of G-Wiz ideas that Arvind Subramanian has brought out, uh, which may not be implemented by this finance minister, may only be implemented by finance ministers who are not yet born because it's very forward looking, but nevertheless welcome uh, to add to the vast uh, number of suggestions that have already been there. Okay, Arvind, I mean, the bottom line, looking forward to next year, what you're really saying is, I don't care what anybody else says, India is going to be the fastest growing economy in the world, right? That's the... Uh, well, I think that um, um, what we're saying in, in, in the survey is that the next year is going to be, this coming year, the international environment is looking pretty grim, all right? I, I think, as I said, never before in the 20 years that I've been following the global economy, do I see such a, a, a coming together of so many vulnerabilities all over the globe, you know? And so I, I really do worry that there is a, you know, that, a th you know, growth is slowing down. There could even be quote unquote extreme events. And, and so I think the point is that therefore India's performance has to be seen against this international context, you know. Uh, because we're becoming very integrated with the world. There's a chart which shows, you know, our co the gro correlation between Indian growth and international growth is now high and rising. So, so, so you, know, you know, part of becoming so entwined is, you know, you get benefit from the upside, but you also, you know, sink on the low side. So I think that recalibration of expectations is something I think is very important. I'm trying to understand both the WEO of the IMF and the JEP of the World Bank predicted India at about 7.5, 7.6 for the current year. You are doing the same. And they did this, they came out with their projections before this huge slump that we saw globally in January and February. They then said that this is our scenario and there is a chance of a good one-third fall if things go basically wrong. So would you then agree that if 7.5% is a good case scenario, if things go wrong, that might fall yeah. by 10, 20, 30 percent. So, so Swami, in fact, the reason for the range, you know, the seven uh, uh, at the lower end and the seven and three quarters at the upper end is, is exactly for that reason, i.e., you know, supposing this year is 7.6, you know, the fact that we say put the bottom end at seven is in fact to allow for extreme events in the world economy. Um, whether it could go lower, you know, I don't know, but, um, you know, but, but certainly, uh, y y you know, we want to allow for that possibility uh, of growth being, uh, you know, slowing down considerably because of international events. Right. You've put the main kind of risks at a major devaluation by China. Imposition of capital controls, which I was not quite clear why you view it as such a huge problem, but you didn't even mention a situation like the banks in Europe are in such trouble that Deutsche Bank, the biggest European bank, is quoted at a worse rate than some Indian public sector banks yeah. as a percentage of book value. Yeah. So, I mean, is there a much, much bigger issues uh, apart from just the Chinese devaluation? No, see, see Swami, the, the thing is that um, uh, one of the things that the survey says is, okay, supposing things happen in Europe, right? It's going to be uh, uh, not very dissimilar from other crises that have happened. I think the analytical point is that if something happens in Asia, it could be qualitatively very different from what's happened in previous financial crises. And as we say that, it's the first time something like what happened during the Great Depression, you know, competitive devaluations, beggar thy neighbor, yeah. that possibility arises much more with the East Asian currency realignment than with something Absolutely. like, yeah, th okay. that's what. So let me put it to you bluntly. Suppose China devalues 10%, must all of us devalue by 10%? I mean, I, I, see, firstly, we have a market determined exchange, so I don't know what's going to happen in, 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 in that uh, scenario. You know, it's possible that if there's a capital outflow that may come about naturally, uh, if, if not, you know, uh, we may react in some ways, you know. Uh, but it's something that we have to take very seriously for two reasons. One, there's an aggregate growth slowdown, right? The second is that there are sectoral consequences, right? I mean, so much excess capacity in some sectors, and those sectors in India are hurting badly, you know, steel, aluminium, you know, metal, so on. So, so that's, I think, it's a combination of sector-specific shocks and generalized shocks that we have to be very careful about. We have, you have a discussion on fiscal deficits, on what are the pros and cons of slowing down your path of fiscal consolidation. On the one hand, you say that, you know, okay, Fiscal consolidation, I must remain on this path. But why should I walk at this speed? Why can't I walk more slowly? I mean, that basically is the 
argument be how often are you doing this if you postpone a target twice in 3 years does this sound like a country that is serious about consolidation at a time when global guys are getting so jittery that they are looking for any excuse to pull out and you really have to give them very very hard reasons not to pull out yeah so so i think uh, uh, swami your uh, uh, forcefully making one side of the argument of this debate and i i think that uh, firstly i mean we've had a very lively internal debate on this and and the government has been fantastic in actually encouraging this debate um uh, it's been very animated on both sides because i think frankly there are good arguments on both sides but remember i think the the credibility argument is slightly overdone in terms of promises because i think you get credibility by doing things but the arguments on the other side are are the following that um what is the magnitude of the consolidation that we require to get in fact credibly to 3.5 you know especially when you have all these obligations um the the, the second thing is is that uh, you know the point that you made earlier if in fact there's a massive slowdown you know then do you want to compound that slowdown with this aggressive consolidation and, and so so the credibility argument that you make is very well taken but there are also arguments on the other side and i think it's just a matter of you know how you assess yeah. these things i don't i couldn't find in what i read a statement on state deficits and contingent liabilities one point made by raghu which came, raghuram rajan came to me as a surprise he claimed that in 2015 the consolidated deficit of the center and states was 7.2% a much higher figure than i had thought was the case but that begins to ring alarm bells when you add to that the uday thing and there are all sorts of contingent liabilities which we haven't taken into account so you know in other words the discussing this entire thing only in terms of central fiscal deficit by is perhaps missing the more alarming picture that you get when you take it at the national level so for firstly i think we have a long discussion in the in the fiscal chapter on the consolidated debt uh, situation okay. as well yeah with and without the uday bond as well so okay. so we have a lengthy discussion okay. on that um i think that um until recently you know that the states were less profligate than the center yes. right um i i think in the last year and maybe in this year uh there could be some uh change mm -hmm. uh partly because of the whole discom situation and and some of this going to you know uh going to so i think in the aggregate i'm still not uh entirely sure whether the consolidated deficit is going to come down this year or not it was on a downward path but there may be a, a, a some a one time blip up I, we're not exactly sure that uh, and sure absolutely i think we should be looking at this from a consolidated point of view um uh, but but on this uday thing uh, swami we have to realize that you know you can't have it both ways i mean if it's a contingent liability taking it on just to kind of codify something that was there in any case so it's not something new i mean we can't say oh because of uday suddenly our debt to gdp ratio has gone up because it was always a contingent liability and the contingent liability became an actual one i think that uh, what is i think i would say something a little bit more uh, 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 something different about the fiscal i think we benefited from that interest growth differential for a long time which worked in favor of debt dynamics for us you know because uh, we had high inflation high growth nominal gdp was growing gangbusters nominal interest rates were lower and that wedge has changed now with the slowing down of of growth and this and so the question is what do you do to get the debt to gdp because remember i think that when you look at india's public finances i think it's a very simple question you know is the path of deficits and debts declining at a steady level because it's not we don't have a crisis that we say we have to adjust today one way or the other we must be on a steadily declining path of debt and deficits and i think what the survey says is that we can be on that path to go on from there you know the survey su suggested existing assets can also be sold to finance deficits you given the example of the nbfcs like tourism finance corporation and you know things like that which uh, presumably rail finance co i mean a number of uh, such corporations you are suggesting that you can sell these uh, in order to get the money for recapitalizing the banks and then a very novel suggestion i had not heard this one before that the reserve bank of india has too much money in equity and why doesn't it have that 
can you elaborate what, in what uh, what are these equities it holds and can they be disinvested at what kind of price do you think how much could you fetch uh, in the case of the bank situation i think what people don't recognize adequately is that to solve this bank what we call the twin balance sheet problem as we said you know we've gone from the twin deficit to the twin balance sheet problem we have to get recognition i mean i find out what the true state of these assets are right and i think the rbi is embarked on this exercise but then the second r is recapitalization or resources you know it's one thing to say we have a problem but unless you can plug the hole i i think markets get very jittery and nervous right so that's where it is and of course we need resolution and and reform we'll come to that but i think the question is that can we find those resources from from other parts of the public sector balance sheet okay and you mentioned some what the survey the, the kind of new idea that we think it's not new at all it's it's actually several people have said this before we've just brought it to light is that actually uh, uh, if you look at the uh, the rbi and compare it to other central banks uh, the amount of equity uh, there is in uh, government equity is just almost off the charts uh so so it's a very well capped so it's a mirror image i mean the the public sector banks maybe you know the capitalization is is kind of uh, we we're still a work in progress but on the other hand our central bank is just super well capitalized because of you know a prudential uh, behavior over the last many years so the question is that can some of this uh, government equity in the rbi be redeployed towards uh, equity in 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 the uh in the so this is an idea but i think that this is you know it has to be seen as something that you know first is it the case is it true uh that uh, the rbi has all this uh, government capital second uh in a very cooperative way can we actually see whether this money can actually be used you said we need a medium new medium term fiscal perspective okay fair enough it's been a long time even though you haven't quite achieved the last target in the new one what would be new would you go for instance for like gordon brown's golden rule that nothing uh, nothing no, no no money uh, is to be borrowed except for projects would you go for the idea of a cyclically adjusted target because frankly india is not yet used to the idea of cycles yeah. we seem to believe that growth should just be up up up, up. you know but but actually uh, you've uh, uh, raised Uh, you know good arguments for why we should remember we have a medium term uh, you know legislation right but i think there are three or four uh, new developments uh, 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 swami yeah? first remember we're talking about a medium term fiscal framework so one we also need a medium term expenditure you know expenditure has to be done in the meantime you know planning commission is no longer there you know we have niti ayog which has a different mandate so that's one second we do medium term revenue projections in the context of the 14th finance commission and those projections have been overtaken by 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 events you know for example they assume nominal gdp growth of something like 14 15% those have been overtaken so that's another reason but i think the third reason is what you mentioned i think that uh the even the existing thing that we have has a deficit target uh, whatever and we know world over uh, the the thinking on this has evolved considerably for example you raised one right i mean because remember what do you need in a medium term fiscal framework i think you need some kind of anchor it could be a deficit anchor it could be a debt anchor uh, or it could be something in between and it must make provision for counter cyclical fiscal policy so we need to integrate all these things and that's why uh, you know cyclically it just frames very good thing but you know they fiendishly difficult to implement even in good in 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 countries in in europe but i think we do need to think about these things very carefully and we need to uh, come up with with some i mean the golden rules is another good example primary deficits that could be another but we need uh, both an anchor and provision for counter cyclical fiscal policy you think that we need to tax our guys much more i mean what are the things that comes out uh, actually you got so many charts that it's possible to take different angles on different things you got one chart so it says that you know at our per capita income maybe our tax is not out of line and then you say but if you are a democracy then you are out of line correct somebody could say that means you are the most prudent among the democracies 
Did you the most prudent among the doctors? <laughs> <laughs> I see. I know this is your no, like I said, you, you, your economic freedom. In, <laughs> see, I, I, I think that you know, Swami. I, I think for me, the, at least, it was a real revelation. You know, because people look at the headline numbers and say our tax to the GDP is X. You know, Korea is Y, and therefore, you know, we're undertaxing. And I think that just understanding that from in money terms. I think broadly my view is that we don't undertax or underspend. If you take into account how democracies, you know, how over what period they actually do these things and why they do it. I mean, the US and Western Europe developed this because of war and, 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 and the Great Depression. But I think that being said, in terms of the number of people who pay individual tax, for me, that is key to building accountability between state and citizens, right? There we really are outliers, you know. Uh, I, the, the, the ratio that I like is the ratio of voters to taxpayers. You know, that's the kind of the sync between political accountability and economic accountability. We're at 4%. Our crude calculations say it should be something like 23, 25%. So, and, and I think there are, I think there are two lessons here. There are easy ways of doing it, right? And point totally taken that, is, you know, we should not harass, we should, it should not be complex. But I think we need to think about, you know, broadening the tax center, bringing it in. One thing, you know, the Chinese, very simple. They, you know, they have these exemption limits and they just didn't cha haven't changed them over time so that natural income increase brings you into the net. We've changed exemption limits very radically and that's, that's a low hanging fruit. But I think the broader point which I think you will like is that I think that in increasing taxes has to be about people saying we will be willing to pay these taxes. And therefore, you have to build legitimacy in the state. The survey calculates that just on a few items, better off people are getting one lakh crores in the form of various subsidies. People who think they are middle class are actually in the top 5%. Yeah. So they are not, I mean, uh, many people taking part in this discussion would not regard themselves as super rich, but would be certainly very, very high up yeah, in the income yeah, ladder. Yeah. So in a poor country, uh, people who look super rich when it comes to paying taxes, think of themselves as middle class. Exactly. So this problem is a perceptional one, which I don't think you will easily get away with. No, yeah. but, but, but no, but, but I yeah. think this exactly we want to dispel that self-perception okay. by, by, by bringing new data. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. Government has committed to phasing out the corporate tax exemptions. So, so you know, I, I think there is a there is a strong commitment there. And with the GST, if we have a get in, get a clean GST, some of the numbers that we calculate will be addressed through that as well. Subsidies, fertilizer subsidy. You know, what about giving whatever so many kilos? of even free urea per farmer and beyond that everybody else pays. You think this is workable? So, so I think I, if, if you read our, our fertilizer chapter and our jam chapter, you see, firstly, you know, again, fertilizer is caught up in this, you know, in, in this poor farmer thing, which I think it's politically uh, sensitive and we have to be aware of that. Uh, I think that uh, we say that fertilizer is r ripe for DBT. Uh, you know, direct benefit transfers, because uh, I think the leakages are substantial and we actually come up with a number for how much those leakages are. And I think what people don't uh, realize about the whole DBT and, and the jam thing is that, you know, Pehel has been a great success. Cooking gas has been a ter terrific success. Many people are focusing, there are many experiments going on in kerosene and, and food. But remember, those are basically implemented by the states. The advantage of fertilizer and the other thing that we say about government programs is these are controlled by the center. And that's why they're eminently uh, good candidates for the next phase of the DBT experiment. Given the scenario you have painted for the coming year, you seem to say there is scope for monetary easing. The prices more or less will be under control. So would you like to hazard a guess? How many basis points do you think interest rates can come down in the coming year? So, so Swami, I, I think that first let's be a, a little bit careful here because I think on monetary policy there are two interesting things. One is that, which is something that we actually uh, uh, elaborate in some great detail, you know, the policy rate cuts have not gotten fully That's transmitted good. into bank rates. Yeah, And the interesting thing is that they did get passed after the first three rate cuts, but they haven't got passed after the last bigger rate cut. In fact, after that last rate cut, uh, the spreads between short-term rates and policy rates have gone in the opposite direction. 
So, so the question is that is liquidity too tight, even given current policy rates? So I think we make a case that that might be the case. So, so the first element is, you know, and this is something the banks have also been talking about that liquidity is very tight. So I think that has to be, that's one part of it. So just even forgetting about the policy rate, should liquidity become easier? Uh, easier? Yeah, open market operations. More, yeah, more, more, more repo operations, open market operations. The second question, of course, is, you know, are, uh, uh, given the inflation outlook, do we need more things? And I think, you know, the view we take in the survey is that, you know, the, if you look at all the factors that determine the inflation outlook, I mean, they suggest that, you know, there could be scope for easing going forward. And as you said, I, I think that, you know, um, this is a theological debate whether, you know, we used to do WPI, now we do CPI, pros and cons. But the fact is that, you know, there are parts of the economy which are suffering from very high real interest rates, as you mentioned some. So I think if you take the totality of all this together, I think, and, and the inflation outlook, maybe there is scope for, for easing. But that, you know, again, that's a call that the RBI will take. Overall, which, are, I mean, there, there is this, inter, this international risk to this uh, growth scenario. What are the main internal risks, including the political risks? As we say in the survey, you know, there have been things, you know, I, I think that, you know, in terms of the unfinished agenda, even the carryover, you know, there's the GST, uh, there's the, you know, the strategic disinvestments. Uh, I, I think the, uh, um, the twin balance sheet uh, thing may be more forceful on that. I think those are the, are, are the domestic challenges. And I think that, uh, you know, if we can crack that, of course, a lot will depend on the politics. Uh, but if we can crack that, I think, uh, you know, we can still be quite hopeful. Very good. Inshallah, all of that will happen. And on top of it, we'll have a bumper monsoon. Yeah. Thank I, you, I, I, And there's, a, there's, a, there's a hopefully a good chance of that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash etnow and don't forget to click the like button. You can also follow us on Twitter at etnowlive. To stay updated with all our programming, hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel by logging on to youtube.com slash user slash etnow.